world news tonight. Tensions escalate. New reports reveal growing threats of retaliation from ISIS terror groups. Nor'easter strikes. State of emergency in New York as flash flood watches are up for 28 million people. Impending doom. The United Nations warn of a global climate calamity with actions taken too little too late. Spooky pause. Furry friends dress up for some trick-or-treating fun. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with a growing terror threat. A top Pentagon official has warned that the United States must tighten its grip against terrorism as groups like IS develop their capability to launch attacks. Against that possibility. In testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee on Tuesday, senior Pentagon official Colin Call told Congress that Islamic State in Afghanistan could have the capability to attack the United States in as little as six months and has the intention to do so. I think the intelligence community currently assesses that both ISIS-K and Al-Qaeda have the intent to conduct external operations, mm -hmm. including against the United States, uh, but neither currently has the capability to do so. We could see ISIS-K generate that capability in somewhere between six or 12 months. I think the current assessments by the intelligence community is that al-Qaeda uh, would take a year or two to reconstitute that capability. The remarks from Call, the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, are the latest reminder that Afghanistan could still pose serious national security risks for the U.S. even after pulling all troops out of the country in August, ending its two-decade-old war in defeat. The Taliban, which won the war, are enemies of Islamic State in Afghanistan, also known as ISIS-K, and have seen its attempts to impose law and order after the U.S. pullout thwarted by suicide bombings and other attacks claimed by the terrorist group. Call said it was still unclear whether the Taliban has the ability to fight Islamic State effectively following the U.S. withdrawal, estimating that ISIS-K had a cadre of a few thousand fighters. Call also suggested al-Qaeda in Afghanistan posed a more complex problem given its ties to the Taliban, the same ties that led to the U.S. military intervention there in 2001 following the September 11th attacks that were carried out by al-Qaeda. President Joe Biden, whose supervision of the chaotic end to the war has damaged his approval ratings, has said the United States will continue to be vigilant against threats coming from Afghanistan by carrying out intelligence gathering operations in the country. Call said the goal was to disrupt Islamic State and al-Qaeda, so they don't become capable of striking the United States. In the U.S., the season's first nor'easter began with torrential rain and strong winds. The storm con continues to strengthen off the coast and would become a bomb cyclone. High winds, rains and midwestern tornado were among the weather emergencies experienced by many cities and towns across the United States. The fury of the season's first nor'easter, beginning overnight with torrential rain. In some places, a month's worth in less than a day. In Cape Cod, Massachusetts, the surging water trapped a woman in her car, stuck in the unrelenting deluge. A flash flood watch was put in place in New York, a city still recovering from the deadly effects of Hurricane Ida in September, which claimed 11 lives and shut down the subway. But for this storm, a much less intense one, the city was ready. In New Jersey, school districts preemptively shut today, bracing for possible flooding. The storm continues to strengthen off the coast and could still become a bomb cyclone like the one that just slammed the west coast. Tonight, the rain will be pushed out of New England by punishing winds as an unpredictable, powerful storm refuses to let go. An executive at TikTok faced tough questions during the video sharing app's first appearance at a U.S. congressional hearing, saying it does not give information to Chinese government and has sought to safeguard U.S. data. Big tech preys on children and teens to make more money. Social media executives took their turn in the hot seat Tuesday in the Senate hearing on child safety online. Potentially harmful content. Executives from TikTok, YouTube, and Snapchat fielded tough questioning on how their platforms were working to protect young users. Are you going to get drugs off Snapchat? 
But perhaps the most fire was reserved for TikTok, which is owned by Beijing-based ByteDance. Are you going to answer the question? Or, answer or, the question or not, were you instructed not, not to answer this question? Some senators allege that the app, known for viral dance moves, obscured a more insidious intent, harvesting Americans' data for the Chinese government. If the Chinese Communist Party asks you for U.S. user data, what is to stop you from providing it? Since Senator Marsha Blackburn, the top Republican on the Senate Commerce Committee, pressed Michael Beckerman, TikTok's head of public policy for the Americas, on whether the company could resist giving users data to China's government if material were to be demanded. We do not share information with the Chinese government and... Beckerman testified that TikTok's U.S. user data is stored in the United States with backups in Singapore. Republican former President Donald Trump had sought to bar TikTok from U.S. app stores, saying it collected data from American users that could be obtained by China's government and posed a threat to U.S. national security. Democratic President Joe Biden later revoked Trump's plan but sought a broader review of various foreign-controlled apps. Cracking down on big tech, especially social media platforms, is one area that sees rare and broad bipartisan support in Congress. Lawmakers in both parties are especially keen on reigning in the world's largest social network, Facebook, after a damaging leak of internal documents revealed how the company put profit ahead of users' well-being and safety. For the first time in four years, the leader of the United States has joined his ASEAN counterparts for a summit. During the talks held virtually, President Biden underscored the importance of U.S.-ASEAN ties. The engagement is seen as part of Washington's effort to ex expect collective efforts against China's growing influence. On Tuesday, U.S. President Joe Biden took part in a virtual summit with the leaders of ASEAN for the first time in four years that Washington has engaged at the top level with the regional bloc. This comes as President Biden is seeking to intensify U.S. presence in the Pacific as China continues to emerge as a national security and economic adversary. Biden said his administration plans to provide up to 102 million U.S. dollars to the bloc for regional development, stressing that Washington's relationship with ASEAN is a linchpin for maintaining resilience, prosperity, and the security of the region. In fact, we intend to launch a new program and initiatives to enhance our cooperation across the range of issues, totaling more than $100 million. Our bottom line is that ASEAN is essential, I want to say that is essential to the regional architecture of the Indo-Pacific. The fund will include spending for health and welfare, a new climate initiative, as well as other programs to help ASEAN countries recover from the pandemic. Myanmar was not allowed to attend as the group banned its military junta leader for ignoring the bloc's roadmap for peace that was agreed upon six months ago. However, the other leaders shared their concerns over Myanmar's worsening crisis. President Biden denounced a military coup for its use of, quote, horrific violence against protesters. He added the U.S. will focus on sending support for the people of Myanmar for its democratic path, as well as for the protection of safety, security, and human rights. On Wednesday, President Biden will join the broader East Asia Summit, which brings together ASEAN and other nations in the Indo-Pacific region. Myanmar's former leader Aung San Suu Kyi is under detention and is being tried on several charges, including an allegation that she illegally imported walkie-talkies for her bodyguards, use and used the radios without a license, and violated COVID-19 pandemic restrictions on two occasions during the 2020 election campaign. This is the only image of her trial since it began on the 14th of June. The junta is maintaining a tight grip on information about the proceedings. Aung San Suu Kyi's lawyers are no longer allowed to comment publicly in case the military says they disturb public order. The ousted leader of Myanmar, under house arrest since the 1st of February, is facing many charges, illegally importing and using walkie-talkies, breaching coronavirus restrictions, sedition, violating the Official Secrets Act and corruption. Back in March, the junta published testimonies against her. Between 1989 and 2010, Aung San Suu Kyi spent 15 years under house arrest. She could now spend the rest of her life behind bars as some of the charges bring 15-year prison sentences. Her numerous supporters on the streets of Myanmar are calling it a show trial, motivated by politics alone. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news.
welcome back. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres urged world leaders to avoid a climate catastrophe as a new UN report said the planet is on track for an average 2.7 degrees Celsius temperature rise this century, despite current global climate pledges. The clock is ticking. The emissions gap is the result of a leadership gap. But leaders can still make this a turning point to the inner future instead of a tipping point to climate catastrophe. A call to action from United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres Tuesday as a newly published UN report found that, despite international commitments to cut greenhouse gas emissions, the planet is on track for a 2.7 degrees Celsius temperature rise this century, a rise Guterres called catastrophic. The warning comes as world leaders are to meet at the COP26 climate summit in Glasgow next week to try to commit to a more ambitious climate pledge. It could be the last chance to reach the goal of the 2015 Paris Climate Accord to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius. As world leaders prepare for COP26, this report is so another thundering wake-up call. How many more do we need? The recent IPCC report already showed that unless we reduce global carbon emissions by 45% from 2010 levels by 2030, 100 months from now, we will not reach a 1.5 degree future. The report said G20 countries, which represent 80% of global emissions, are not on track to achieve their original or new 2030 pledges. And as extreme weather events like wildfires and floods continue to wreak havoc globally, Guterres said the heat is on leaders to do more. The heat is on. And as the contents of the report show, the leadership we need is off. And far off. We know that humanity's future depends on keeping global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2030. And we also know that so far, Parties to the Paris Agreement are utterly failing to keep this target within reach. Buckingham Palace said Britain's Queen Elizabeth has pulled out of the COP26 conference in Glasgow next week after she was advised by doctors to rest in a blow to the United Nations Climate Summit. Britain's Queen Elizabeth has pulled out of hosting a reception for world leaders at the COP26 Climate Change Summit. Buckingham Palace confirmed on Tuesday the 95-year-old monarch had been advised by doctors to rest. The Queen spent a night in hospital last week after undergoing preliminary investigations for an unspecified but not COVID-related ailment. In a statement, the palace said, quote, Her Majesty has regretfully decided that she will no longer travel to Glasgow to attend the evening reception of COP26 on Monday. Instead, the Queen would deliver an address to the assembled delegates via a recorded message. Elizabeth's son and heir, Prince Charles, and his eldest son, Prince William, are still due to attend. The Queen is the world's oldest and longest-serving monarch, and next year celebrates 70 years on the throne. Britain has cast COP26 as the last big chance to slow rising temperatures, as it hopes to persuade world leaders to adopt tougher climate targets. The Queen was recently overheard saying she was irritated by world leaders who talked about climate change but did nothing to tackle it. We have some good news for you. As Australia faces increasing global pressure to take further actions on its carbon emissions ahead of the UN COP26 climate summit, a team of engineers at the University of Newcastle have patent a world first material specified designed to store thermal energy in the form of a block. Let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Timothy Philip who reports now from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy. Yes, Jeff. The blocks made from aluminium and graphite store renewably generated energy to redispatch it at night or when needed. With their research predicting the blocks can last about 30 years without any change in reliability. Co-inventor of the Miscibility Gaps Alloy, or Thermal Block and CEO of MGA Thermal, Erich Kesey says the team was working on thermionic converters when they had the breakthrough. While many countries have pledged to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, Australia, one of the world's largest emitters of greenhouse gases on a per capita basis, has declined to firm up its targets. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has said, 
Australia wanted to achieve net zero as soon as possible and preferably by 2050 and it expects to meet its pledge to cut carbon emissions by 26% to 28% from 2005 levels by 2030. Partnering with the Swiss company E2S Power AG to design technology to retrofit and repurpose retired and active coal-fired plants in Europe using MGA thermal blocks, Kesey says that he wants governments around the world to start recognizing the value of their solution. Back to you, Shannon. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent Timothy Philip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Advisors to the Food and Drug Administration have recommended the FDA approve Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for children 5 to 11. The advisory panel voted unanimously, saying the benefits outweigh the risk. Tonight, a near unanimous all clear from the FDA panel reviewing Pfizer vaccine data for 5 to 11 year olds. Dr. Gans voted yes. So this concludes the vote. Paving the way for an additional 28 million children who would be eligible for a COVID shot, potentially in days, pending final FDA and CDC approval. Any way that we can make it safer and, and keep them in school, I think it's worth it. The Pfizer data reviewed today shows that its child-sized dose, about a third of what's given to adults, is more than 90% effective at preventing symptomatic COVID infection in that age group. Though some hold deep reservations. Six in ten parents in a recent study say they would wait and see or won't vaccinate their children at all. Myocarditis is an inflammation of the heart seen in a small percentage of adolescent boys and young men taking Pfizer or Moderna. Today, experts noted there wasn't a single case of myocarditis observed in Pfizer's roughly 3,000-person trial among 5 to 11-year-olds. I feel very comfortable recommending these vaccines for young children. I've recommended it for my own grandchildren. When my daughters call me and, and say to me, what should we do, I say, the minute the vaccine is available, Get your kids the vaccine. Pressing the issue, the looming holidays and cold weather pulling more people indoors. Nationally, COVID cases have plunged more than 60% since the recent peak in September. But still, there are more than 70,000 infections a day, and kids can pass along the virus to more vulnerable Americans. The primary reason to do it is to protect them, but also uh, getting them vaccinated will help bring infection numbers down across the community for everybody. So it's really important that we get kids vaccinated. A Brazilian Senate commission approved a damning report that recommends criminal charges be brought against President Jair Bolsonaro, including crimes against humanity for his COVID-19 policies. A six-month investigation drawn to a close. On Tuesday, Brazil's senators approved a report recommending that President Jair Bolsonaro be tried on charges ranging from charlatanism and misusing public funds to crimes against humanity for his failed pandemic response. The 1,200-page report also urged the country's Supreme Court to suspend Bolsonaro's social media accounts for continuously spouting misinformation about COVID-19. Just last week, Facebook took down the far-right leader's false claim that people who are fully vaccinated have a higher chance of contracting AIDS. Along with 77 others, three of Bolsonaro's children have also been cited in the latest document, leading them to hit back at what they believe to be a smear campaign. Despite the vote, it remains unlikely that Bolsonaro will leave his post or see prison time. Charges can only be brought against him by the Attorney General and impeachment proceedings by the lower house speaker, two of his own appointees. The Crimes Against Humanity charge, however, has the potential to be tried at the International Criminal Court. Regardless of the outcome, the report will certainly add to Bolsonaro's already devastating approval ratings as he heads into next year's elections, which he is currently on course to lose. Welcome back, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. South Korea completed the world's biggest hydrogen fuel cell power plant. It is expected to contribute to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. The price of crude oil hit a seven-year high, fueled by a global supply shortage and skyrocketing demand in the United States. These are the highest closes since October 2014 for both the global benchmarks. 
Both the AstraZeneca and Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines have been linked to rare but potentially serious neurological complications. There were around 60 cases of hemographic stroke per 10 million given the Pfizer vaccine. However, experts pointed out that not getting vaccinated is still more dangerous. A cyber attack disrupted the sale of heavily subsidized gasoline in Iran, causing long queues at gas stations across the country weeks before the anniversary of 2019 street protests that followed full price hikes. And finally tonight, New York dogs got into the spooky spirit with the 31st annual Tompkins Square Halloween Dog Parade. Hundreds of pups and their owners donned costumes ranging from Spider-Man to the Pope and paraded before thousands of spectators. The event started more than three decades ago as a fundraiser for the Tompkins Square Dog Run and has grown into what is called as the biggest Halloween costume contest for dogs in the world. Both pet poachers and their owners impressed when it came to dressing up for the occasion. An owner inspired by the current events dressed their West Highland White Terrier as Jeff Bezos going to space in Blue Origin. Naturally, there were a fair few costumes inspired by popular culture, including several like Cruella de Vil's with Dalmatian dogs, likely inspired by 2021 hit film Cruella, starring Emma Stone, and a superhero-inspired man who dressed as the Joker with his Wonder Woman pooch. A dose of humor was also applied to the costume choices, particularly in the case of the pooch dressed up as a hot dog and the old English sheepdog, a proud pup who was accompanied by a troop of family members all wearing sheep costumes. The annual event made its return after being cancelled in 2020 owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.